Welcome to class, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Tuesday. I am in New York City. Well, maybe I shouldn't tell you this. I'm at home sick. Cough, cough, wishing I were... <laughs> Welcome to class. It's February 18th, I think. It's actually February 4th, but when you're watching this, it's February 18th. It's Tuesday, and here's the lesson for today. Inference for experiments. So last week, we talked about two sample Z tests for a difference in proportions and two sample Z intervals for a difference in proportions. Today is kind of a little bit of review day. At the start, we're going to talk specifically about how to check conditions and things like that with experiments. Uh, and then the second part, we'll do a little introduction to our next section that we'll be doing the next couple days. So let's uh, jump right in. I have a note here at the top to see the cholesterol and heart, attack ex heart attacks example on page 615 to 616. Um, that's a pretty good example. It's about experiments. So you might consider reading through that if you need uh, some extra practice. Uh, but what mistake do students often make when defining parameters and experiments? And how can we avoid that mistake? And what are some other common mistakes when checking conditions for tests and intervals with experiments? So the most common mistake that students make when they're defining parameters, uh, they would say something like, uh, let's let the parameter P equal the uh, proportion who said they missed me. Obviously, everyone misses me. So um, the problem here is this past tense those who said they missed me. Remember when we're talking about a parameter, a parameter is about an unknown population parameter, unknown characteristic of the population. So when you use past tense like this, those who said and those who missed me, it sounds like it's referring to the sample, which would be referring to p hat. We want our parameters to refer to unknown population. So how do we fix this? How can we avoid making this mistake? Use future tense, future, back to the future, future tense. So you would say the proportion who would say, ah, subjunctive, who would say, that's an easy fix, get rid of that. Oh, there is an eraser, such a thing as an eraser. There we go. The proportion who would say they miss me, present tense is okay or that they would miss me. Make it sound a little more future tense. Um, so uh, that would be our parameter. Make sure you use future tense. So in an experimental context, if we let the proportion be uh, the proportion or the percentage who uh, get better with the pill, whatever the pill is in the experiment with the pill. Uh, percent who would get better would be much, much better. Who would get better if they would take the pill rather than saying the percent who got better when they took the pill. That would be referring to the past, to the sample that was taken, not to the future, the people who could take the pill. Um, the other thing with experiments is since we don't have a random sample well, we have random assignment, but we don't have a random sample. So we can't generalize to the whole population. So when we are um, talking about concluding our experiment and our significance test based on an experiment, uh, we should use the words, um, the percent who would get better with the pill similar to the ones, to the ones in this study. Um, that's basically admitting that, hey, we can't generalize to the whole population. If our study only used 
um, Korean females who are older than 60, then we really shouldn't generalize to a bunch of other people. So we would say, you know, the percent who would get better with this pill, similar to the ones in the study who were Korean females over 60. And if you read the fine print in uh, medical journals, they'll often admit, hey, here, we really only used college students, so we probably shouldn't generalize our results to everyone out there in the world since we only used uh, volunteer college students and maybe even paid them money. And uh, what are some common mistakes when checking conditions for tester intervals with experiments? Um, the main issue is the independence condition. Typically, we check is the sample size less than or equal to 10% or one-tenth of the population size. In experiments, however, we're not actually sampling. We have volunteers in experiments. So to check the independent condition, we would say we would not actually do the 10% condition. We would say we assume that one subject's response is independent of another subject's subject's response. Uh, because of the random assignment, I'll just abbreviate that because I'm running out of space, random assignment and the design of the experiment. Um, so what we're saying here is if one person uh, feels better on this medication, that shouldn't give us any information about like the next person down the road feeling better from the medication. So we'll assume that one person getting better is independent from another person getting better. So the random assignment should take care of uh, a lot of different issues, but also the design of the experiment. If it's a well-controlled experiment, then one person's response shouldn't affect another person's response. If one person's response does affect another person's response, then it's not a very well-designed experiment. You can imagine an experiment... Um, where there's kind of almost like a like a response bias that maybe it's a headache medication and one person taking the headache medication and they're not getting better so they're complaining and they're yelling at all the other patients who are taking the same headache medication well that person not having a good experience with a headache medication they're affecting other per people's experience with the headache medication so we'd like to control for those things so the um, language in the problem won't say necessarily that it's a well-designed experiment. That's why we're just saying like, well, we're going to have to assume that it's a well-designed experiment and because of the random assignment, uh, we can assume uh, independence. So let's look at an example on the page. Oops, it's my stylus. Uh, right here. So, uh, why don't you read this situation, and I'd like to see if you can identify um, the hypotheses that you would write. Uh, check the conditions. Be careful of the independent condition. Uh, calculate the test statistic and p-value, and then conclude in context. Uh, so if you would pause this video, maybe for 10 minutes or so, uh, go ahead and work on this question. Uh, really helpful when reading questions like this. There's going to be a lot of information, a lot of words, so uh, have your pencil or pen ready, and when you, as you're reading it, start underlining or circling the important information. So the first sentence, we have a study about employees trying to stop smoking. In the study, half of the subjects, so half of the subjects, were, ah, random assignment, that's going to be important, randomly assigned, to receive $750 for quitting smoking for a year, while the other half, okay, the other half, were simply encouraged to use traditional methods to stop smoking. 
Um, so the $750 is really not that relevant to answering the question. It's interesting, but not relevant. Uh, none of the 878, there we go, there's our sample size, 878, that's N. Volunteers knew that there was a financial incentive when they signed up. So no one knew there was a financial incentive. That's a, a well-designed experiment. You don't want the group who didn't get the financial incentive to be complaining and very angry that they didn't get the financial incentive, and then that might lead them to smoke because of their anxiety or their stress. Uh, but we are told that they're volunteers. We did not take a random sample. So if you said random sample check, that means please, please take points away from my response because I didn't really realize that they're volunteers. It's not a random sample. Uh, let's see. It says at the end of the year, 15%. So, okay, 15% of those in the financial reward, rewards group had quit smoking, while only 5% in the traditional group had quit smoking. That's a 10% difference. That is some initial preliminary evidence that hey, maybe the financial awards group works. There is a difference there, 15% minus 5%. Uh, one explanation of why it works is why it actually works. It helped people, the 750 bucks encouraged them to quit smoking. Another explanation though, is maybe the people that were in this group, the financial incentive group, maybe they were just more likely to quit smoking. Maybe that group just just so happened to be randomly assigned stronger-willed people that were able to quit on their own. It wasn't the financial program, but they would have quit anyway. And maybe just by random assignment, maybe this group that had only 5%, maybe, you know, just by chances we happened to put the weaker-willed people or the people who wouldn't have quit. Anyway, we happen to put them in the traditional group. So this whole idea of a significance test is, hey, what are the chances of that happening? What are the chances that we get so many, just random chances that we get so many people who would have quit anyway in the financial group and so few who didn't quit in the traditional group? So that's the idea of our significance test. And how do we know from the question they want us to do a significance test? Well, it says, do the data, do the results of the study give convincing evidence? This is a yes or no question. Is there evidence? Yes or no. So this is a hypothesis test. If it were estimate the difference, then we would use a confidence interval. So uh, let me write the hypotheses. So we have the null hypothesis is that the proportion in the money group minus the por proportion in the traditional group equals zero. You could also write that as the proportion who had quit smoking in the money group equals the proportion who had quit smoking in the traditional group. Um, on the AP exam, this way is a little more common than this way down here, but either one is acceptable. We'd like to know if the financial incentive helps people quit smoking. So we would say that our, our alternative is that the proportion in the money group minus the proportion in the traditional group uh, is greater than zero. Uh, you can see that if you don't see or understand the inequality. If you write it like this, proportion of the money group who quit smoking is higher or greater than the proportion in the traditional group. So those are our hypotheses to do a, not one, but a two sample Z test for P money. <laughs> P money is pretty good, and it's like a rapper name, uh, minus P traditional. So we'd like to perform this test if the conditions are met. I do want to note uh, that I define my parameter over on the right, the unknown proportion who would quit smoking with the given method. I guess the only way I can improve my own response is I could say similar to the ones in this study, similar to those in study. Uh, it would be sufficient to just say this amount of information when defining your parameter. Uh, 
but uh, it's definitely helpful when we conclude to mention similar to the ones in the study. So now let's look at the conditions. So first, we have random assignment. This is why you can't just say random check. We don't have a random sample. We have volunteers, but the volunteers were randomly assigned to the treatments, two treatments. Um, so because of this, because we have random assignment of subjects to treatments, we can infer cause and effect. We can infer to the population. That's why we say this whole similar to the ones in the study. But we can infer cause and effect. Maybe one of the trickiest things uh, about checking conditions when you're doing a two-sample z-test for a difference in proportions is you have to use the combined or the pooled uh, sample proportion, uh, which I have on the right here, over here. Um, I got 132 in the numerator by multiplying 15% times uh, 878, and I got 44 by multiplying 5% times the sample size 878. Uh, and then I divided by the total sample size, and I got 20%. I hope it's not too surprising that we got 20%. Since the two sample sizes were equal, one of them was 15%, the other one was 5%, then we should get a combined proportion of 20%. It won't always be like that, though, so you have to be careful. If you have different sample sizes, you can't just add the percentages. Um, so maybe I should pause and remind you, why are we doing this pooled? or combined sample proportion. Well, we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true, and we're assuming that the proportion in the money group and the proportion in the traditional group, um, that the treatment doesn't really have an effect. And the only reason why we see this difference between the numbers is random chance. So if the null hypothesis is true, then we can combine our successes here in the numerator we can combine these and divide out of the total. It doesn't really matter what treatment the person received. They would have quit smoking anyway, regardless of the treatment. Then really, we had 20% of all the people quit smoking. So we would have to use that over here and calculate the N1, the sample size of the first group. That would be 439 times the 20% equals 87.8. And then... Um, same thing with n1 times 1 minus p hat c. Um, all of these are going to be greater than or equal to 10. So what does this tell us? This tells us that the sampling distribution of p hat 1 minus p hat 2 is roughly normal. Uh, you should say something about, therefore, we can use a normal curve to model this situation, or the distribution is roughly normal, or the best option the sampling distribution of p hat 1 minus p hat 2 is roughly normal. The sampling distribution of p hat money minus p hat t is roughly normal. Uh, and these are indeed p hats, not p dollar sign minus p t. Um, the p hats are what vary from sample to sample, not the uh, parameter. That's a constant. Uh, and then the last condition is the independent condition. We would say uh, we assume one subject's response is independent of other of another subjects. Uh, we also assume that the two groups are independent of each other. Uh, this is kind of a also a new condition when we have multiple groups. We have the independent groups assumption. Uh, and this is a fine assumption because we randomly assign them into two groups. We assume the two groups are independent. Uh, so a lot of writing, these two sample 
Z tests and two sample Z intervals, they're definitely the longest type of question you could be asked on the AP exam. And they're pretty common. The last couple years, there's been like one of the six questions is about a two sample test of some sort. Let's move on to the third part. In the third part, we'd like to calculate the test statistic and the p-value. We'd like to know, assuming the null hypothesis is true, that there's no difference between these two treatments, what are the chances that we observe a difference of 15 minus 5, a difference of 10% just by random chance? So let's calculate the test statistic. The general formula is this. Z test statistic equals... the difference, dollar sign, in p hats, that's our statistic, that's a t, that difference, minus the null hypothesis value, the null hypothesis is that there's no difference between the two, so we would have a zero, divided by the standard deviation of the statistic, or the standard error, and we would have, this is mega formula, probably the biggest in the course, we would have um, in the numerator, we have to use p hat c. Be really careful that you used p hat c. So we have p hat c, 1 minus p hat c, over the first sample size. That would be the dollar one. And then another p hat c, 1 minus p hat c. Uh, calculating that will give us the test statistic. So the work we would have looks like this. Voila! Our test statistic. I evaluated with my calculator and I got a test statistic of 3.7. 3.7 is a rather large test statistic. Remember we're asking, we're assuming the null hypothesis is true the null hypothesis is that there's no difference, zero difference. 3.7 would be way out here. That's a rather large z-score or test statistic. The p-value, a little bit of area out there, we'd like to know the probability that we would get a z-score greater than 3.7. We would use normal CDF, and I'm guessing our answer will be very, very close to zero. The lower bound is 3.7-ish. The upper bound is some large number. And I get, <clears throat> um, maybe I'll write it down here, p-value of 1.08. Oh, that's a great p-value. I shouldn't write anything more. That makes complete sense that you'd have a probability greater than one. Oh, it's scientific notation. Let's just call that basically zero. So on the AP exam, we have our formula shown. No, you don't have to write the general one. Just plug the numbers into the formula. Um, this formula, this denominator, is provided on the AP exam, so that's helpful. Uh, but you have to include the uh, test statistic and the p-value. And uh, it's definitely helpful, makes a stronger response if you include some of this other work I've shown. So uh, lastly, we conclude. So let me get rid of some of these. So we conclude since our p-value of 0 is less than any reasonable alpha level, I'll just pick the common one, 5%. We reject the null hypothesis and conclude. Uh, be careful how you conclude. Don't say this proves that the money method, the financial rewards group, um, that's a better treatment than the traditional method. This doesn't prove this. This gives us, we have convincing evidence. I don't think I spelled convincing right. Convincing evidence that the financial incentive helps people quit smoking compared to the traditional method.
So since zero is less than 5%, we reject the null. We conclude we have convincing evidence that the financial incentive program helps people quit smoking compared. You can also say convincing evidence that uh, the proportion using the dollar method and who quit is greater than the proportion who use traditional methods. And uh, like I said earlier in this video, we can't generalize this to all people everywhere using these programs. We can only generalize to those similar to the ones in this study. Um, that's because, I mean, these people are working for, for General Motors. Um, so there are certain demographic, there are certain age, they're, you know, they're all adults. We probably shouldn't generalize this, like, would this help teenagers? Because maybe there were no teenagers in the study. Um, so that is the first part of this video lesson. Uh, hopefully that was good practice on the four-step process doing a two-sample Z test for a difference in proportions. It's a mouthful of a name. Uh, but the next part, I'd like to introduce the next section about the sampling distribution of a difference in means instead of proportions. So on the next page, we have uh, the level of cholesterol in the blood for all men aged 20 to 34 follows a normal distribution with mean 188 uh, milligrams per deciliter and a standard deviation of 41. For 14-year-old boys, uh, blood cholesterol levels follow a normal distribution with mean of 170 and standard deviation of 30. So less variability, 30 compared to 41, and lower cholesterol. And that's, hopefully that makes sense. They're younger, they're healthier, they haven't eaten as many pork rinds as other uh, 20 to 34-year-old men. So suppose we select uh, independent simple random samples of 25 men and 36 boys and calculate the sample mean uh, cholesterol level. Not sure where, where that came from. So I'll get rid of that. Okay, so what do we mean when we say a sampling distribution of X bar M for men minus X bar B for boys? So uh, let me just show you what uh, this would look like in a sampling context. So I have a little bit of code here. You're going to be looking at this uh, blinking cursor on the left. So let's say I took a random sample of 25 uh, cholesterol levels for men. Uh, here you go. Here's a random sample of 25. So this one uh, on the left here is the first one, 158, and then you have 8, 15, 22. So uh, 22, 23, 24, 25. So the 252.3 is the 25th guy age 20 to 34, and his cholesterol level, he looks like he's a little uh, high cholesterol. 252 is pretty high. Um, now let's say we took a, uh, found the mean of that sample. So the mean of the sample is 181. So that's our X bar uh, M for the guys. Let's do the same thing for the boys. Here's a random sample of 36 boy cholesterol levels. Notice there's more numbers than before. Up here with 25, here's 36 numbers. Let's say we find the average of those cholesterol levels. Um, so notice what we have here is when we sampled 25 guys, their cholesterol level was 181. And when we sampled uh, 36 boys, their average cholesterol level was 172. When we talk about the difference, x bar m minus x bar b, uh, all that we're saying is if we take this minus this, we would get, uh, what is that, about 9-ish. Um, we get about 9, and that particular set of samples. So we'd like to know how much does this quantity vary in sample after sample after sample. And that's what a sampling distribution of uh, the difference in means give us. 
So let's look at uh, another one. Now this one is going to calculate. It probably won't give me 9 because it's picking a different sample. Um, this set, we took a mean of the guys minus a mean of the boys, and the difference in the averages was 36. Here is a 26. Here's a 24. Here's 11. 11 is closer to the one we first got. We got about a 9 that first time. And we can keep taking, whoa, whoa, wait a second. We got a negative 1.3. What does that mean? Well, that would mean, if it's negative, that would mean, so, well, we got to got to write this down. If you did x bar the guy cholesterol level minus x bar the boy cholesterol level, if you got a negative 1.13, that would mean that this number was bigger and this number was smaller. Small minus big equals a negative number. So that means we happen to pick a sample, a random sample of boys, that their cholesterol level on average was about one point higher than the cholesterol level from a random set of guys. So you can get positive and negative uh, cholesterol levels. So what would it look like if we repeated this over and over and over again? Rather than me like going like this and hitting enter every time, it would be nice to just like visualize what's going on. What's the distribution look like? What's the variability? What's the center? What's the shape of the distribution? Well, if I did this in a savvy way, I could do a bunch all at once. Here are the difference in sample means. That's quite a few of them. And this is a 1,000 trials. Uh, and let's plot those as a dot plot. Oh. Let's plot those as a dot plot. Ah. So one of these dots represents one of these dots represents the difference. Notice the x-axis down there. The difference, men minus boy, in the sample mean cholesterol level. So I wonder what shape that is, huh? Yeah. And notice where the center is. It looks like around 20-ish. And the standard deviation, if we were to guess the standard deviation, uh, let's see if we draw a little curve like that. And this is the center-ish. Maybe it's a little over 20. My curve isn't very accurate. Uh, maybe a standard deviation is about like, I don't know, maybe 10 or so. Another way to tell standard deviation if we go like that, um, this is about 50. 50, this is about negative 10, that's a distance of 60. And we'd have 1, 2, 3 standard deviations, 1, 2, 3 standard deviations. So that would be divided by 6. So yeah, about, about 10 is the standard deviation. So rather than having to do a, a simulation like this to determine the shape, the center, and the spread, we have formulas uh, that will determine those for us, which is really helpful. Get rid of this. Um, so that's what we mean when we talk about a sampling distribution. We mean taking a sample of M and finding a mean, taking a sample of B and finding a mean, finding the difference of those, and then plotting that as a dot on a dot plot and repeating that a large number of times. So we'd like to anticipate the shape, center, and spread of the sampling distribution of x bar 1 minus x bar 2 without doing a simulation. So we know the shape because earlier we were told that both distributions are normally distributed. Therefore, three dots and a triangle. Therefore, the sampling distribution. You probably want to write smaller than I'm writing right now. <clears throat> of x bar men minus x bar b is roughly normal. Let's say we weren't told they're normally distributed. You would need both sample sizes to be large enough, cough, cough, greater than 30 central limit theorem, to be a roughly normal distribution. Um, the center of the distribution 
we need to go back and peek at what were the means of the two distributions. So the center of our distribution, the mean of x bar men minus x bar boy, that would equal the mean of men minus the mean of boy. You might recognize this notation. Maybe back when we were talking about sampling distributions, we had mu x bar. That equaled the actual mean, mu. Same idea here. You just have two populations, two means that you're pulling from. So our center would be 188 was the given mean above in the stem of the problem. Minus 170 was the mean for boys. And that was 18. Uh, do you remember what my guess was? Do you remember back here? I'm going to have to get rid of this. Do you remember back here when we did our simulation? Notice the mean I said like was maybe about 20-ish. It's actually 18. So that simulation with 1,000 trials got pretty close to the true mean of 18. Okay, so now let's look at the standard deviation. The standard deviation of x bar m minus x bar b. Well, that would equal the standard deviation of x bar m plus the standard deviation of x bar b. But we can't add standard deviations of random variables, so we need to square these random variables, or square these standard deviations. Um, so really, the standard deviation is the square root. This should look familiar, Pythagorean theorem of statistics. The square root is that. So we would have the uh, standard deviation of x bar for the men was 41 squared, uh, let me write it this way, uh, 41 over the square root of 25 squared plus 30 over the square root of 36 squared, and then square root all of that. Uh, that looks kind of messy, but what we, what you get, see if I could fit it here, is our standard deviation is the square root of 41 squared over 25. Notice the square root here, you're squaring that, so it's going to disappear. And then plus 30 squared over 36, because the square root of 36 is 36. So we have this general formula. This standard deviation of our sampling distribution is equal to the square root of the uh, variance for the first group squared over the sample size of the first group plus the variance of the second group over the sample size of the second group. That's our general formula for the uh, standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the difference in means. And it is provided on the formula sheet. But when we calculate that, lo and behold, what do we get? We get a 9.6. Uh, you might remember from the simulation, the dot plot, I had guessed it was about 10-ish. It's actually 9.6. The simulation was pretty accurate to this reality of 9.6. So how do we use these numbers? What are we actually doing here? Well, we had a mean of 18, we have a standard deviation of 9.6, and we have a roughly normal curve. So if we scroll down right here, find the probability of getting a difference in sample means that's less than zero. Well, we have all the information that we need, actually. We just calculated it. We have a roughly normal curve. Our mean is 18. That was our difference in sample means. Our standard deviation here was 
and this less than zero gives us our boundary that looks like it's about two standard deviations away and we want less than that so that would be that shaded area so this is finding a probability with a sampling distribution of a difference in sample means um, so to find that we would calculate a z-score uh, that would be our boundary minus our mean divided by our standard deviation and then uh, we would calculate the probability that z is less than that number and I get negative 1.875 negative 1.875 so about two standard deviations uh, and the probability would be uh, that probability uh, that's the probability that we would get a sample that's negative remember when we said negative um, this way is the boy cholesterol ended up being higher than the men's cholesterol whereas positive values the men's cholesterol on average was greater than the boy cholesterol on average. Um, so we get a very small probability. That should make sense that it's a small probability because on average guys, older guys, have higher cholesterols than 14-year-old uh, boys. So should we be surprised if the sample mean cholesterol level for 14-year-old boys exceeds the sample mean level for men? Uh, in other words, should we be surprised that we got a sample mean that's less than zero? Um, this is a pretty low p-value. It is less than our typical 5% level. So, uh, yes, we would be surprised. Be surprised. Um, so, to kind of recap, you need to make sure you know the formulas for the center, the spread of a sampling distribution, as well as the shape of a sampling distribution. Uh, if there's time left in class, if you would turn the page, I've given you an example here with a simulation uh, based on an experimental context, and I'd like you to answer the questions that are there. Thank you for watching this video, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow in another video.